Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available on our website in our archives for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, and I'll show you at the end of today's show, I'll show you where you can um, access all of our recordings. Both our live show and recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share, uh, spread the news with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so be similar to your state library. Um, so we provide services to all types of libraries in the state, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, uh, historical societies, anything and everything. Um, so we will have shows on Encompass Live, <coughs> excuse me, that could be for any type of library. Um, we really, our only criteria really is it something to do with libraries, uh, something cool libraries are doing. Um, we do interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, um, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations sometimes for um, programs and services we're offering through the commission, but we also bring on guest speakers, which we have this morning. Uh, and that's what we have today is Erica Rogers. Good morning, Erica. Good morning. And she is from our Hastings, Nebraska Public Library, and she's going to talk to us about some cool things she did with their programming kits uh, and how you can do it too. So I will hand it over to you, Erica, to take it, take it away and tell us all about it. Well, hello. Um, as she said, my name is Erica Rogers and I'm with the Hastings Public Library. Um, and today I'm going to be just talking about what we did um, with programming kits, especially when COVID hit and then how we're continuing to use those strategies and things like that, um, even now as we're moving forward. So. We're going to start with, of course, uh, let's see, there we go. Um, so we all remember when COVID hit in 2020. Um, it was kind of a scary time. We had to close our doors. We had to um, kind of figure out what we were going to do to still serve our communities because people still needed programming, uh, possibly even more, because at that time people were being isolated and you couldn't, a lot of people were afraid to leave their houses and things like that. And so um, coming up with programming would be a way to kind of help ease those nerves a little bit and try to reach people and not make them feel quite so alone. So we came up with programming kits and these were kits that you could take home. Um, our idea was that these kits would provide all the materials that they would need in order to do the program. Um, and then they would get to keep the leftovers. That way we didn't have to worry about the germs that were coming back. They didn't have to worry about the germs of the person who used it before them. And um, it was just a little bit more of a peace of mind. But this is uh, kind of an easy thing to think about. But then the social aspect is where we really struggled because again, uh, people were being isolated at this point and we were really worried about um, those people that were living alone and not getting out and talking to people. So the solution that we came up with was Zoom. Um, we gave people a couple of different options when we sent out the kit. Um, the picture you see is the sheet that we handed out with all of our kits that were sent out. We gave them the option of a Zoom meeting which is where we would go live and send them the link and we would do the project together. Um, that way they could talk to each other. We left the mics open and we treated it just like we would an in-person class. So they could talk to each other, they could ask us questions and it kind of built as much of that um, feeling of being together as you could at that point in time. Um, but we also then op uh, offered a video tutorial. Uh, so if the Zoom meeting didn't work um, or they were too busy or wanted to just do it at a later time, uh, this video tutorial was one that we recorded that they could watch at any point in time. 
it um, went through the project and um, I'll talk about that, I guess, in just a little bit. Um, but um, so what I'm gonna be talking about next is like how to adapt the program. So you have the program concept and you decided that you wanna do it as a take home kit. How do you do that? The first thing you do is look at the supplies. This is something that I do even with in-person programming. Um, but when you're thinking about sending kids home where you don't want to receive the stuff back, you have to think about the type of things that you want to send out to people. Um, you want to buy in bulk, but you also need to have like a certain amount. Um, so um, one of the things that I would suggest is to start by looking at what you have. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So even if it doesn't match the inspiration project 100% because you have a lot of yarn on hand and they suggested using strips of paper or something like that, um, you can definitely adapt and use what you have. Oh yeah, um, get creative, but we, definitely. I mean, exactly, always yeah. have so many different kind of crafts and leftover things around. <laughs> <I know laughs> exactly. <I> do. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to be like, oh, okay, well, what can we use instead? <laughs> Um, and a lot of that comes into play with like this stuff. So again, like at this time we were talking about sending stuff home that we didn't want back. So the big thing that we had to think about was what kind of containers do you want to send this stuff out in? You know, um, paint and glue, they're wet, they're sticky. You want to make sure that they have lids that are secure. Um, you got to think about what kind of glue you want. Is it going to be hot glue? Is it going to be crafting glue, Elmer's glue, super glue? Um, and so, again, that would be a point where you would look at the project and be like, well, this is calling for a hot glue gun. What can we use instead? And we have, you know, this giant tub of glue because we used to do all of these projects. Um, so instead of buying like little glue containers, you could then portion it out into, uh, we use little makeup containers that you can buy. Um, yeah, um, as far as paint goes, you, we found that you could buy the paint strips that for like the little paint by numbers and things like that. And then you could cut those down to fit the number of uh, paint colors that you offered them. Wow. So then that would be another thing is what colors do you want to send out to them? You know, the paint strips held 10 different colors, but did you want to send out 10 different colors of paint or did you just want to shorten it and give them fewer options? Um, yeah, and then of course, um, what are you going to be sending the stuff home in? So at that time we were just using gallon sized plastic bags. They were easy, they were semi affordable. You could buy them in bulk. And um, then it also again, reduced that germ factor there and everything fit nice and inside. Um, we also used paper lunch sacks or um, just again, leftover things from other programs that we had had. Um, and so, yeah, we got creative definitely a little bit. Um, so depending on what size of a library you are, um, some suggestions for places that you can buy these materials, because uh, it's not, you can do as much as you can with the stuff that you have, but then um, you do still have to supplement. So hopefully um, a lot, you are allowed to do some online shopping. Um, that's really what saved us because especially when we were closed, we couldn't go out to the stores, but we don't have in our town, we don't have big stores like Hobby Lobby and craft stores like that. So we uh, buy a lot of stuff off of Amazon and um, that's kind of a go-to for a lot of people right now. But also the Dollar Tree, they have really upped their craft game over the last year or two. And they have a lot of stuff and it's usually pretty cheap. Um, the downside is you do have to buy in bulk quantities. Usually it's of 12, but if you're buying for a program, you're probably doing around 10 people anyway. So it's usually it works out just about okay. Um, but they will do both in person and they will ship to your library as well. Um, Walmart, Hobby Lobby, Michaels, those are all places that have online ordering as well. And again, you can get it set up 
so that they'll send it directly to your library and then you don't have to go shopping for those specific things that you need. Um, I know at one point in time, paint was really scarce because everybody decided they wanted to go paint. So we had to stop and like search for all of these places and we ended up finding it on Michael's was the only place that had paint. So uh, it was just kind of thinking like, just because we don't have access to it where we're located, where are some places that, you know, do still have this stuff that will then send it to us. Okay, so you've uh, kind of got your project figured out, you've gone through the supplies, figured out what it is that you're gonna need. The next step is making clear instructions. Mm. Um, the first thing with, a with making clear instructions is starting with the materials list. So I suggest listing off every single thing that you are including inside the kit and then also including items that they might need from around their house. So for instance, if they need to have scissors and you're not sending them because most people have scissors around their house, I would list that as a material that they need. Um, we did start sending home glue guns. Um, we did ask for those back. We checked them out to people just like we did um, a, a book item and then they could return them and we would then quarantine and sanitize them. Um, but we have them just for the programming kits. So it was kind of an experiment. And actually what we found is when we started asking people if they needed a glue gun, um, a lot of people already had glue guns at home and we really didn't need to send them home. So that was kind of interesting too. If you just ask people what they need, a lot of them already have your basic yes, supplies. Yeah, I know mm -hmm. I have multiple ones because I keep misplacing them. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that, that's the thing. Do you know where it's at? And do you yeah. have glue stick? That might be a different story, but yeah. Um, and then as the kits were going on, after a few months of us sending them supplies, a lot of times they would keep the supplies. So you could ask, do you need another set of paintbrushes? Do you need another set of of this material and they would often just come back and say, no, nope, I've still got plenty left over from last time. So that was kind of a nice thing too. As far as the instruction sheets themselves go, the key is simplify. So you want these instructions to, these are a guide, these are to help people while they're doing their projects, but you don't want to overwhelm them. So, um, this is kind of the format that I would use. You can see there to the, um, I would use bullet points. I would use um, a table format and lots of pictures. Um, like I said, you want to pretend like they're in person and you're talking to them, um, but they don't have the opportunity to ask questions. So maybe I like to pretend that I'm explaining this to like a first grader. So even though it's an adult that you assume knows all of this stuff, pretend that they don't and go through and just make sure that you go cover everything because they won't be able to ask questions unless they attend that Zoom session. Mm -hmm. um, but these instruction sheets have really proved to be useful even when we have gone back to in-person programming. So, yeah. Um, is this the thing that also the instructions I know this, I remember doing something, some sort of an assignment in elementary school. It was to show, teach someone how to do this thing. And it's one of those kind of tricky things like, you know, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And if you don't get all the exact instructions in the right and people follow your instructions, literally, you realize you've missed something. <laughs> um, so is this something um, that you could have like one person writes it up and then gives it to another person and says, okay, see if you can follow these, you know, uh, you know, test it out on another staff member, I suppose. Yes, I definitely I, did that a lot in the beginning. Um, towards, you know, the more you do it, the more you kind of get it figured out. Um, but yes, it's always a very helpful if you have the opportunity to let a staff member go through it and try to do it themselves first. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful. Yeah. And, and the pictures for me, so I ended up usually making three products by the end of it because I would go through and I'd make the project first myself so that I could figure out how to do it. 
then I would make it a second time while writing the instructions so that I could take pictures and snap each step. And then um, I would have somebody else go through the instructions and see if they could do it. Or when we were creating our videos, I would then be going through it as well. Sure. So I usually ended up with a lot of copies of each of these projects. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very thorough. <laughs> Um, and speaking of being thorough, um, the last thing you want to include in these instructions is a picture of the final product, because a lot of times we just didn't think about it. We were like, all right, congratulations, you're done. Um, but then people would be like, well, did I do it right? What's it supposed to look like? So it's very important that at the end that you uh, just include a snapshot of what the inspiration project looks like. And I encourage that this is a picture of one that you have actually done and not the inspiration picture that you pulled off of Pinterest or the blog or wherever, because it's not going to look like that in most cases. And so if they can see the homemade look, you know, that it's not totally perfect, um, that is helpful as well. Um, so then after you make the instructions, we did these video tutorials. And this is just, we, again, this was kind of like the third step. So we would go through, we'd write the instructions, and then we would make up these video tutorials. And they're very conversational. Um, we really wanted people to feel like they were in the room with us. So we were lucky and we had two staff members that were in most of the videos. Um, so we could kind of bounce off of each other and catch the things that the other person was missing. Um, I do have um, the link here to one of our, our video lists. They're super wonderful, I promise. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I'll mention here while you're talking about the links there, um, you know, people, if you want to, you can you could write that down if you want to. But um, the, the slides will be available afterwards with the archive of today's show. So um, if you don't want to, you don't have to worry about writing all that down. You'll have a link to these and be able to get to it all later. Yes, that's a good point. Um, so again, we really want these to be conversational, really simple. We um, didn't use any fancy software. We just recorded it with Zoom. We went through several different trial and error type things as we were doing this. We tried just recording the Zoom meeting. Um, that didn't work very well um, because people then would turn off their cameras and they didn't want to talk. And that kind of defeated the whole purpose of trying to make it feel like you were all in the same room together. So, um, and then also you can't really control what people say. So um, we only recorded two Zoom sessions before we thought we're, we're just gonna not do that. So then we went to pre-recording it with Zoom. So we would pretend that it was the Zoom session and we would just walk through it, um, pretending like we were talking to the people that were in the Zoom session with us. Um, but also then it didn't really need to be that fancy video quality or anything like that. Um, no sound effects or zooming in or things like that. We kind of got creative. Um, but again, I feel like that homemade feel was kind of comforting because it made people feel a little bit more like they're there um, and not so much like just watching a professional quality video, you know. Um, but we also had just a ton of fun with it too. And that's the important thing. Whenever you're doing programming, you just gotta have fun with it. If you have fun with it, people will have fun with it too. Okay, so that is all of the things that we were doing while we were shut down. And um, even as we started to reopen, we continued doing a lot of those things. And, um, but now things have kind of, gotten back to a relatively normal um, place again. And so it's like, how does this still apply? And I think it has really helped out a lot just in terms of preparing and planning and helping to just rethink about um, how we want to do programming. So, um, it really, I still follow all of these guidelines and steps when I am preparing a program. 
I still like to make, stop, make a thorough list inventory of our materials, thinking about what we have um, and things like that. And we actually will usually still make the kits, um, but instead of sending them home with people, we will then just set them out in the places. We have people register for the classes, so we know how many that we're going to be making. And then um, we have everything all in the kit. So when they get there, it's a lot easier and it saves time um, when they get, you know, from going and handing out materials or them going and picking things out. Um, I mean, some things you do want them to have options. So like we don't put the paint in the, you know, in there anymore. We let them pick their colors, but um, it really helps with that time management as far as making sure that you have everything for everybody before the class starts. Mm -hmm. And the instruction sheets are also still a really great idea um, because people sometimes don't always catch everything as you're talking. They may be more of a visual learner. So if they have the instruction sheets with them and they don't catch what you say, they can then follow along with the instruction sheet or they can go back to it and refer, especially if you're having a larger class. If you're having a class with more than like 10 or 15 people, it can be really hard to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Yeah. So those, yeah. So those instruction sheet guides are just a really great tool to have. Yeah, that's that's a good tip. That's something, and, and you're talking. You always think about doing this programming in person. So well, everybody's here in the room, so they'll just see what I'm telling them to do. Easy. But yeah, not everyone. Everyone has different learning styles, and that is something that um, teachers know about all the time. But um, sometimes with us in libraries, maybe not aware that yeah, you might need another way of showing someone how to do this. Um, and it might, exactly. you know, yeah. Um. And then, of course, you can still do kits. So um, we have a couple of clubs. We call them clubs, but they're just kit programs that we've started. And they're in a similar format. Um, our Spice Club has all of this stuff in it, and it's really popular. Um, and so we put all of the stuff inside the bags. And um, the difference is that with the Spice Club kits, we do want the bags back. So we have reusable burlap bags that they get to take it home, they get to use all of the spices and things, and then the next month they get to bring it back. Um, and then we do try to sanitize them um, before we send them back out again. But it's the, the same idea because people really like to have something that they can come pick up and take home and do in their own time. Um, and then for the kids, we have a virtual Lego club. And what that one is, is again, we just have little kits with all of the Legos in it. It's kind of like the Lego kits that you can buy for really expensive amounts of money. Um, sure. but they're just little simple, like one month, it was like making a turtle. And so it has all of the Legos in there, it has the instructions and a picture of what it's supposed to look like when they're done. We limit it to, um, depending on the kit, 10 to 15 kids, um, and they can just come pick it up and take it home. And they don't have to bring anything back for that one either. Oh, so but again, it's the Legos then? They get to keep the Legos. Nice. Yeah. So it's a really fun program that they can do. And then they can do it together as a family too. Mm -hmm. So it's just the yeah. idea of the kits is opening up a lot of different possibilities. So even though we don't have to do kits anymore, um, there's still a lot of options and things you can do. It's just another service to offer, yeah. And I think this has come up um, a lot now um, due to the pandemic of people have gotten used to these new services that libraries were offering and really enjoyed them. I mean, like I said, like the family aspect of it, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that, you know, oftentimes um, parents or caregivers will bring the children to the library and say, okay, go there, do your crafty thing, do your thing. I'm gonna go look at books over here or, I'll come back in half an hour and pick you up from whatever I'm doing. And they're not there. It's like, here, it's the thing for the kids. But if the kids, child, children are doing it at home, yeah, the parents or care caregivers may be right there and get to be more involved. That's mm -hmm. a cool side effect I hadn't even thought about. <laughs> we had a lot of people that were doing that with our um, take and make kits uh, through the Pixel Lab. Um, they would mm -hmm. send us pictures of them doing it together as a family. I was like, oh, that was really great. Nice. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a nice side effect. 
Yeah. So we do have a question that I want to jump into right now since we're on this slide here. Someone wants to know, they're very interested in this spice club. What is how is what is that all about? That sounds very interesting. Like how what do you get for that? <laughs> uh, right. So this is not a program that I do, but um what it is, what I can tell you is every month it comes with a different spice and you get a sample of the spice, you get a take home. Um, we put in two to three recipes um, involving the spice. You get mm -hmm. some history on the spice, like where it came from and what it's mm -hmm. well known for, some nutritional facts. Um, it all comes together in a little bag. And then, yeah, you just get to take it home and do what you want with it. Um, I know we've done like cardamom and that one was really good. It came with, um, what was it? Cardamom whipped cream recipe that was delicious. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> um, a couple months ago, we did uh, star anise, and mm. that was kind of a weird one. Uh, and so it came with a savory recipe for like pork chops, and mm. it was really good. So, yeah, it's just it's cool. So kind you can of try fun things that maybe you would never like buying a whole jar of star anise. Who's going to use that generally, unless it's a regular thing? Um, mm -hmm. that's a lot, <laughs> but having just one or two, the, yeah, yeah, expensive too to try out. That's so cool. Oh, I love that idea. <laughs> it's been really popular. Uh, we started that in January, so mm -hmm. it's been, it's been really popular. Um, so really that's kind of all that I have. So I've just left lots of time for questions. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, anybody, if anybody has any other questions, go ahead and uh, type into the question section. Um, if you want to know anything about any more about any of the kits that Erica did there, um, how they handled anything, um, uh, go ahead and do that. We have plenty of time to ask questions, no problem. I'm going to pop this open here so I can see everything. Um, we did have another question that came in. You were talking about um, with the spice kits actually uh, sanitizing. You said it was burlap bags. How do you I guess sanitize um, something like that. I know for some things like with Legos, even before this, people they would get washed. And for some things, it's just that we you'd mentioned the quarantining things, just letting things sit for a certain amount of time, so you know that any germs have died. Um, is there something particular for like a fabric type thing like that, burlap bags? Yeah, um, I think we've just been washing them, but um, you could also use like. You could just spray them down. We like the stuff that you use to spray on your counters and stuff. If you just spray it down, it'll soak into the fabric and do the same thing, and it'll dry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't, need, you don't need anything special. No special no. Yeah, equipment or anything for that. Yeah, I think that's something we've all um, adapted to. With all the COVID things that we do now, um, we learned how to do are now just a regular daily part of life. Yeah, and yep. it works. Awesome. Because um, I get to keep. Them the containers and stuff so we don't ask for whatever the spices come in or the leftovers or anything like that it's just the bags right only certain things that you'd want to reuse yeah <clears throat> um okay um oh so we do have a question uh if you want to uh, this question is about the lego club um want to know where did you get the kits for the lego club you, um did you are those kits that you bought or did um how did you come up with those? You said one was a turtle or? I'm not for sure. Um, that's another one that I'm not personally doing. I know that the Legos come from Le the Lego company. So I'm not sure if it's on their website that anybody can go and see the kits, but we do um, order like the specific colors and things for the kits. Oh, but, okay. Uh, I think it's a program that they offer. Oh, nice. Okay, so it's not like you had because I know lots of um, many libraries have le have had over the years in the past Lego clubs where it's just here's like buckets and buckets of all the Legos we have. Go and make something yourself. You know, make up something. Um, and that's what she asked. The person asked, did you make it or just break down bigger ones and make up the thing? But no, these are actual like mini smaller kits that are you can get from Lego themselves that actually have here's all the pieces you need to make the thing and. Uh, Oh, I didn't know that. I think it kind of started off though um, with us using the Legos that we had. Because um, I think our first one was like making snowmen or something really simple. 
-hmm. So I think that was where the concept started and then it kind of evolved a little bit. Um, Cause I don't see, yeah, you could definitely just, if you have Legos laying around. Yeah, you can um, make up anything you want, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'd but Lego really is very to... good about coming up with ideas of things you can do. And they have kits now too, even some of them are, you can make uh, multiple different things with the same Legos they include in a box. I've seen some of those um, recently. It's like um, um, 20 bucks for a box or something, and it makes two different animals depending on how you use them. Not two at the same time, you gotta pick one, but <laughs> these Legos could make this animal, or if you take that apart, then it can make this animal. I've seen that, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, ah, ah, here's a good question. How are these kits funded, specifically the Lego kits? This other person wants to know. Um, is this just into your, because you said this, some of this is things you were doing, some was new. Um, how did you budget for this or get grants or how did that all work? Um, yes. So the Lego kits are coming out of our programming fund. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It's not, we didn't get a special grant or anything for it. Um, I know that we are just trying to do more things like that instead of the big programs. So we're just allocating the money differently. Um, okay. I don't have a better answer for that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah, you already, I mean, that, yeah, you already had a budget line, a line for that, for programming. And so you just use it in this new way, yeah. Um, and, and I, I suppose, do know that when we were coming up with our budgets for this year, you know, the 2022 year, we did, you know, stop and think about things like we're going to need money to purchase extra materials for this program or because we're sending out kits, we're going to need the money for this. Um, so we just thought about that kind of in advance when we were writing up our budget proposals. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, did you ever uh, consider um, charging for any of it, charging the, the people who are using the kits? I know some libraries I've seen, sometimes there's a small, you know, um, a registration fee for attending the, the crafting event or, or, you know, the program to cover the cost of supplies. Um, is that something you have, all have ever done in Hastings? We've done it before, um, not very often. Most of, we're very fortunate um, that our foundation um, is yeah, is pretty things. flexible, and we don't abuse it. <laughs> but um, we have before with more expensive projects. Mm. Um, I think we did like a clock making class once, and so it was just like a five dollar fee to cover the part of the the kits or something like that. Mm. Um, we've done tumblers before, and um, they could either purchase one of ours or for the class, or they could bring in their own type of a thing. Ah, sure, sure, uh, okay. But primarily we don't charge. Mm -hmm. We try really hard. Yeah, <laughs> if you have that foundation to support it, that's 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 key, that's very important, yeah. Um, and I know some libraries also do um, fundraising for these kind of things. They say, we're doing, a, we're doing a kit, a program coming up. I see it posted on social media, Facebook, whatever, saying if anybody has any, you know, Empty milk bottles, whatever. <laughs> we could use them. And we've definitely done that before. Mm -hmm. Reaching out and be like, do you got any old socks? <laughs> right. The thing yeah, that was around. a random one. I did like five years ago, but <laughs> <laughs> I put a cute little sock dobby up and I was like, we're looking for mismatched socks. No, yeah, everybody's got those. Socks. Yeah. <laughs> so we're making dog toys. So. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, okay. that was but yeah, water bottles, a toilet paper tubes, um, mm -hmm. staff. A lot of times we don't have to reach out to the public. We'll just send an email out among staff and be like, hey, can you guys save this up for a while? Yeah. And we'll get it that way. Absolutely. Cool. Um, I see your camera's been going on and off. That's that's not a problem if you're having issues with that. <laughs> oh, now you're back. Fine. Oh, yeah, it was, it was frozen up and then it went off, but now you're back. Yes, everything's good. Nope. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe just the system. Sometimes it knows that too much going on. Whatever. Yeah. Um, all right. We have a few more questions here. Um, um, for the tutorials, how long were they usually? The video tutorials. I don't know if you mentioned that. Uh, I don't remember for sure. I would say that they were about ten to fifteen minutes. 
-hmm. depending on how fast she went through the stuff. Okay. And do you post them? Are they up on your website or um, where do you, how did people get access to those? So if they registered, they got an email link that had um, both the video and the Zoom link. Um, mm -hmm. And then we posted them on our YouTube page. Oh, okay. So are they still out there? If somebody wanted to go and look at them? Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. That, that link that I, I put in the Prezi oh, there the is the oh, awesome. You are. Okay. All right, off they're there. not. I don't think we ended up saving all of them, but most of them. And we're not still doing the video tutorials. Mm, okay. Uh, Those are just from before. Time, yeah, you could. I mean, they were a lot of fun to do, but <laughs> yeah. Now, now that people have access to coming in, we're like, well, uh, even if we're sending home a kit, they can call and ask us or. Like the Spice Club kits and stuff that we are sending aren't really project based, so mm -hmm. they don't really need the video. True. Yeah. Take this home, make it a recipe. Hopefully, it, it comes out edible. <laughs> exactly. Send us your pictures. Yeah. <laughs> um, ah, okay. So, someone also wants to know and do you have a list of the craft kits you have done that you could share? Um, or is there somewhere? Um, to see them or that you would share with like, I don't know if they want the full information or just. I could, yeah. I don't have that put together right now, but I have all of this stuff saved in my, you know, on my work stuff. So mm -hmm. it'd be pretty easy for me to do. Uh, maybe email me, have them email me. Does that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if anybody wants to, um, yeah, have any of that, um, reach out to uh, Erica. And I think your email address is pretty. What is your email? Let's see. Um, e Rogers at City of Hastings dot org. Yeah, so pretty easy. Um, here I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, I'll put something together. All right. I just sent that out in response to that question into the question, so everyone should be able to see that. Um, just Erica's email address if you want to. Um, also, I think you're listed like on the. I've got a link from the session page to the Hastings Public Library website. That's a way to get in touch with her too. <laughs> if you don't grab the email um, from here, not a problem. I didn't think about that. Um, I, I did this uh, similar presentation um, in person at NLA, and so I had handouts um, that I gave people. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think about that for this one. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I was I, I meant to mention at the beginning. I, I forgot. Yeah, that this was a session that was originally done. Um, this presentation back in was it October last year when conference was October September. Ah, I forget. Our, our Nebraska Library Association State Conference. Um, yeah, this was a presentation done back then um, that we um, I invited Erica to come on and redo here to spread the word even farther to people. Um, and I'm sure things have changed since then um, of what you're doing. <laughs> um, the pandemic just yeah. comes and goes and there's always you know things yeah yeah hopefully we don't have to go back to 100 percent virtual again but it's always nice to have the ideas if you do yeah it's nice to have this in your back pocket for if things if something else happens any i mean and this is you know any other kind of um pandemic issue natural disaster or something now we know there's ways we can still provide services to the people, you know, if there's a flood and the library is inaccessible, here's things that are we can do. You can, you know, shift gears. We know how to do it. We already figured it out. <laughs> um, exactly. Then, yeah, do it so much easier now. Um, it is something that I've talked about a lot with in the last couple of years um, with lots of libraries doing these kind of virtual things. Just other ways of doing things is that accessibility issue that these these virtual or these take home are so important. I think to people who um, never came into the library before or couldn't. Uh, some parents or caretakers cannot 
don't have the time to drive their child to the library and have them do the event and then drive them home necessarily, but they do have the time to say, hey, here's a Zoom th event going on. Let's sit there in front of it together and we'll do that. And then we're all still at home and didn't have to do that part of it. Um, it's, you know, it's, I, I've, I heard the other story times and things too, that so many parents are so thank you so much that you're doing these things. And I'm glad that libraries are still continuing them in some way because, it's not just because we're not in a lockdown, there's, there still are people that need these kinds of, of services. It's just a new um, avenue of service for people, uh, for people like that who just can't get to the library, people with social anxiety um, who wouldn't get out but can do this kind of thing like we're doing here, um, people who are still immune compromised or um, disabled or cannot physically get out are now having so much more offered to them. Um, and I think it's great that, you know, We've discovered these things and hope and libraries are still continuing them. You've got a whole new audience that uh, discovered. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, one last question here. Is there anything, and I know you talked about how you worked all this out, any major pitfalls or um, lessons learned as you're going through this process? Like, you know, I, we, I always try to say you, know, you can learn from failure and it's okay. So what didn't work? <laughs> Um, well, like I said, the big one was the Zoom sessions. We really had to trial and error our way through that um, because when we first started, we tried recording it and it was just not, we had some inappropriate things that were said and then I was like, okay, because we have like a very small knit group of ladies that do these classes. And so in person, they know each other and it's like, oh, hey, you know, it's funny. But when it's being recorded and sent out, I was like, um, it's not, nice. yeah, they know each other. It's casual. It's friends. That's a whole different thing than, yeah. Yeah. And so that was a big one. Um, learning the different types of materials that you could send out was a, just a really big one, you know, mm -hmm. trying to figure out those containers and things like that like what are we gonna is this going to be enough paint if we just send out this little paint pod or do we need to find like a film canister or something that you know and actually we got to the point where if it was a big project it was only 50 cents a bottle for paint at walmart so sometimes we would just send out the bottle of paint if it was just one color mm -hmm. uh, but lots of trial and error working with craft materials you know, you're going to practice on a lot of things before because it's, it's you know, I'm sure you've done trial and error practicing just doing craft events in the library before, of course, ahead of time. So you know what you're doing before you teach it. But having to send the things home with someone is a whole nother type of <laughs> experimenting. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, it, like I said, it really helps now because it's really easy to see a project and go, oh, yeah, we can do that. We just need to get, you know, some clothespins and some paint and some glue and we'll make a snowflake. But yeah this forces you to go through it. And like I said, I went to end up doing it at least three times before it was all said and done. So I could really see the things that are going to go wrong and try to solve them or at least be prepared to like give advice like, okay, so when you go to do this part, you're gonna wanna make sure you do this. And don't do uh, this because I did it and it was wrong. <laughs> it didn't <exactly>. work. <laughs> and sharing those stories too with people, you know, they. Mm -hmm. You know, if they know that you're not perfect, you know, sometimes it goes back to putting your picture versus the inspiration post, because Absolutely. seeing that you're, you're struggling or hearing that, you know, really helps them build up their confidence too. like, mm -hmm. it's okay that, you know, it looks a little sloppy, but that's because that's normal. It's homemade and it's, and it's a homey. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be perfect. No, no. You want someone to know you made that, but yeah. Um, okay, well, I have another question here. I was supposed to know, did you have a certain day and time for patrons to pick up kits? How did you schedule that? Um, I suppose maybe when, when you were closed officially, um, how did you work out um, that? Uh, yeah, so when we were really, really closed, we had them pick up and we um, would schedule a date and time. You know, we would call them and ask them, when can you come pick it up? And we would give them two days of options. And then they would um, call us when they were outside and we would go give it to them, mm -hmm. um, which was not ideal. Uh, and so then we went to a, well, now we're at a locker system. So we were able to then put 
put the kids in the lockers just like we would a, a whole book and call them and say, well, you've got it in this locker, you have until this date to pick it up. And if, which would usually be, so our programs were are on Mondays. And so we would put the kids in the lockers on Thursdays to give them Thursday, you know, most of the weekend to be able to pick it up. And then we would leave it there all the way until Tuesday in case they mm -hmm. didn't realize that they were missing the class type of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we also then we just labeled them and we when we we're open uh, but still doing the kits we put them on our hold shelf oh, and so sure. then they could, just like yeah hold so we would put them up, so yeah. just like a hold on a book that's kind of how we treated the kits was like hold books mm -hmm. however you would get them out to people that would be how you would do it with the kids yeah nice um so of course you mentioned the lockers and now people are like what what's that all about <laughs> um and i know many libraries have gone to and it was before pandemic some libraries are doing it but since during um lots of have done it we did give out grants to some libraries to buy those things and install so um can you uh quickly explain how that um how your lockers work there at hastings yeah so we have um a set of lockers they're little square that stack on top of each other just kind of like you would see in school and they're outside of our building and i believe there's 20 to 30 of them i don't remember and uh we have the option when people put a hold on a book that they can pick it up in person or they can pick it up in the locker and uh we set the books in the locker we have padlocks that uh, we change out daily and um, well we change out with each reserve so it's not locker number one doesn't always have this lock mm -hmm. um and so then we when they have we call them and tell them that their item is ready to pick up we give them the locker combination and we give them five days uh, mm -hmm. which is our standard hold pickup time and they were able to do that without coming into the library nice yeah and that was a very convenient thing that libraries started doing um and it's just so creative it's it's easier it's it's safer for them if they don't want to come in um but it's also uh they don't have to come when the library's open that's a key too yes. for people who working who work the same hours as the library's open so they can't get there when you're open they can come anytime they want <laughs> and that's something yeah that was a side effect that we didn't plan on <laughs> but yeah we have a lot of people that you're like, oh, well now I can come when I get off work or the only day I can come is Sunday and that's the day you're closed. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been, or families too have really enjoyed it because we don't have time to load up all of the kids and bring them into the library so they can pick it up in the, the locker and kind of save time, kind of like the grocery store pickup. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just, so it's someone does a question, and this is not something I heard about, but um, do you don't have any issues with vandalism or break-ins with the lockers that are outside there? Not with the lockers, no. Um, the thing that we tried before that was we had um, plastic uh, newspaper bins hmm. that the schools had used and those didn't have locks on them. And so anybody, like we just put like donated books and stuff. So people, this is when we were closed, closed. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of checking out books, they could just come and grab books, kind of like the free little libraries. And we did have kids that would come and take the stuff and throw it all over the place and vandalize that. But we haven't had any problems now that we've put locks on them. Yeah, these are like secure metal lockers and you know, the padlocks that's not easy to get into <laughs> no no yeah i mean if they really want to do go through all of that effort to steal some library books yeah exactly yeah. it's not like there's something crazy expensive or that they're going to be able to you know and we don't put we, we we won't put kindles or anything expensive in the lockers those you still have to come pick up mm -hmm. that makes sense absolutely yeah Cool. I mean, we probably would if we ever got to a shutdown phase again, but. Nice, okay. It's really nifty. Yeah. Uh, someone did ask earlier about um, the funding of it, and you said you you all had the um, the programming budget. 
Uh, but I did just want to mention that, yeah, there um, we had many libraries over the last two years apply to us at the Library Commission for grants. And this may be something your states did or uh, your state library or your um, whoever you might get grants from. Uh, we re There was funding uh, CARES Act money in the first year of the pandemic and then the ARPA, American Rescue Cl Plan Act money this year. Um, and many libraries did apply for these kind of programs, anything virtual, anything Zoom, um, lockers. Uh, so I would definitely recommend looking at grants, uh, seeing what your state library is offering or anything um, outside the box, <laughs> other kinds of uh, grants that you can apply for. There's lots of grants for like public entities or municipalities where you would think of, you wouldn't think of a library necessarily because it's like, oh, that's for the city or something. But then they say any city department can apply for some of these kind of things. So um, there are definitely grants that you, um, if anyone doesn't have the funding to do these, that I would highly recommend looking into. Um, and, and seeing if there's um, a way to fund this kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the kits and, and craft things are a little less expensive, but lockers, those are can not cheap. I mean, lockers themselves, having them installed, cement poured, whatever needs to do to make it uh, secure. I know in some places uh, for weather, they've um, built like permanent canopies over them or put them in, a, in an area so that there's no worry about like rain or snow uh, getting into them. So I definitely uh, look for grants in. Um, any other, we got a little five minutes left here. Anybody have any last minute desperate questions you want to ask of Erica? Type into the question section. I did give you her email address as well, that erogers at cityofhastings.org if you do want to reach out to her there. Um, I am going to, well, wait to see if anybody has any other questions. I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen because since I was just talking about it, I'm going to show everyone. Okay, uh, this is the session page for today, but um, on our Nebraska Library Commission website, I actually have a section here on grants. We have a whole flyout menu here about grants, um, but anyone can go to this. This is not just for Nebraska libraries, but I have a grant opportunities for Nebraska libraries link here, which is just nlc.nebraska.gov slash grants. And I list the kind of grants that we give out, but then um, ideas for other places that libraries can go to uh, for grants. And here specifically in Nebraska, Humanities Nebraska, if you have a humanities department here in your state. Uh, Nebraska Arts Council, Historical Society. Um, we have grants available, well, we don't offer them. Our state is from our Department of Economic Development. Um, and uh, the USDA, these are for facilities, as you can see, as you can see. But some of them are just anything to charitable organizations. Uh, so feel free to look at this page for more ideas for grants and then have resources here for other places to find even more grants that are out there. I just kind of pulled out a few that I know of um, that I know our libraries in Nebraska have used. Um, so definitely get creative, look for, at all of these different things and just think about, you know, we are a nonprofit, we are a part of a municipality, anything that uses that wording, we could be potentially get a grant for our library. Um, ooh, oh, we do have another question that just popped in, awesome, uh, about the spice kits. You said you did a history um, of the spice themselves. Do you do that about the meal of the recipe itself too? Like where does this come from or what is it, what the actual recipe is all about? Um, mostly it's just the spice um, because the recipes we get are usually like off of blogs, you know, or online resources. So there's not a whole ton of information about them, mm -hmm. but we do, we'll, cite the original source that we got it from um oh and, nice so they can go back and look yeah, it for, yeah yeah and we give the nutritional information and things like that but right. typically the recipes we don't have a whole lot of information about mm. okay so then they did ask about adding the health facts about that spice so you said nutritional information so you do include that part of it yeah mm -hmm. so it's interesting to see the history of a recipe or a blog post that talks all about it uh, depends on your what you're in the mood for. If you want to read up on it, or if you just like, I just want the recipe. <laughs> I just want to make this. Good. Exactly. Like, just get down to the recipe part. Yes. <laughs> there, it's a lot of fun. I I haven't done all of the spices, but as staff, yeah. if there's leftovers, then we get to. Oh, when they yeah. test them out, sure, of course. See that that's the cool thing you have to do. Of course, you got to test out all the recipes. <laughs> there's not always leftovers, but. 
sometimes. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Get back to our, there we go. All right, uh, well, almost at 11 o'clock, awesome, perfect. Uh, anybody have any other questions? We do not have to cut off right at 11. Um, this will just go as long as people do have anything they wanna ask. So um, go ahead and type any questions you have and I'll just do my little wrap up here while I'm waiting to see. Um, as I said, we are recording the show right now and it will be available on our archive page. I'm gonna go here to our main Encompass Live page. Um, if you use your search engine of choice and just type in Encompass Live, the name of our show, Nothing is called that on the internet yet. Nobody's allowed to use that name. So you will come up with our pages in your search results. Um, these are our upcoming shows, but the link to our archives is right here underneath. And the most recent one is at the top of the page. This is last week's show. Uh, and so today's will be there as well. Uh, by the end of the day, tomorrow at the very latest, everything should be up and ready as long as GoToWebinar and uh, YouTube cooperate with me. Uh, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show, even if you didn't attend, will get an email from me letting you know that it's available. We also push out on our various social media. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. You see here we do a reminder. She's a reminder about logging into today's show, a little um, introducing our presenters. And then I do post on here when the recordings are available. So if you um, do like to use Facebook, you can do that. Um, we also go out on Twitter and Instagram, and we have a hashtag for the show, Live. So a little abbreviation for the name if you wanna see um, when anything is announced. When, when everything is ready. Uh, while we're here on the archive page, I'll show you there is a search here. I did mention that we do lots of shows and lots of topics for all types of libraries. Um, and uh, so you can search and see if we've ever had a show on a particular topic you might be interested in. Uh, we can, you can do the show, full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you just want something current. And that is because this is our full archives. I'm not gonna scroll all the way down because it's um, a huge, huge page as you can see. Um, this is our full show archives since, from when Encompass Live premiered, which was in January, 2009. So, um, we're going on 12, 13 years worth of shows here, um, every, weekly shows, um, almost every week of the, of the, of the year. So uh, just pay attention to the original broadcast date of any show. Everything's got a date, so you know when it actually happened. Um, many of the shows will stand the test of time, still be good, useful information, but some things will be old, become old, outdated. Resources may have changed drastically or might not even exist anymore. Um, links might not might be broken. Um, people who presented on a topic may no longer work at that library. So, um, so just pay attention to the date. Uh, but um, as librarians, you know, this is something we do. We keep things for historical and archive pur archive purposes sometimes. And as long as we have a place to host them all, we will always have them um, available here. All right. So, oh, got another question that popped up here. Um, <laughs> ah. Oh, oh, so you said you do the nutritional information. Is that nutritional information about the recipe as a whole? like at the end of the recipe or um, this yes. about what about like health facts like supplements certain spices are good for your heart or antioxidants those kind of things so both um ah. kind of in the, when we're talking about the history we also talk about the benefits and the health stuff um about the actual spice but then with each recipe there's also the nutritional information about the recipe sure sure so a little both perfect yeah that's exactly what people need all right. Oh, and a good question here, which is actually a question for me. Want to know if we get a certificate of attendance for attending today? Yes. Um, approximately an hour after we close down end the show today, everyone will get an email from the GoToWebinar system saying thank you for attending. This email um, shows as proof of your attendance for uh, attending the show. And there is also a PDF certificate attached to that email. Um, that is if you do need to um, use it for applying for CE credits, continuing education uh, units, uh, whatever you do in your state. Um, we have them here in um, Nebraska to our uh, CE coordinator here. You're in CE hours um, for keeping up certifications as librarians and library boards do. So um, yes, you will receive something within the next hour, uh, letting uh, proof of your attendance that you can use and submit to whoever you need to submit to. Um, we cannot issue credit for anything outside of Nebraska. For if you are from outside Nebraska, we don't have the authority to give out 
credits for other states, but we give you that certificate and that email that you can then submit to whoever does give you your credits and use it for that. All right. Any other questions you want to ask? We're a little after 11 o'clock here. We got a perfect 11:04. We started a little after 10, so perfect hour. Anything else you want to ask? Get in. Otherwise, you can email Erica um, the recordings. You'll all be notified of that, and the link uh, of the slides and the video of today's show will be available. All right, we just got some things coming in. Awesome. Um, I think we will wrap it up for today's show then. Thank you so much, Erica, for coming on today and talking about this. This is great. You know, lots of tips and tricks and ideas. Um, and obviously, people are very interested in trying to replicate some of the things you're doing. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk about library things. <laughs> of course, yes, absolutely. All right, so um, that'll wrap up for today. Uh, here's our upcoming shows, and you can see we've got August, and we're starting to get our September dates on here too, so keep an eye on here. Next week, I will be talking about E-Rate. Um, if you are in a public library or a school um, and want to know about E-Rate, um, getting discounts on your internet access and your um, networking equipment, I'm doing a one-hour quick overview of it. We do do fuller workshops later in the fall, um, later in the year, um, three hour longer workshops on um, E-Rate and special construction and things. Uh, but just uh, since that's going to be a lot later in the year and the process is opened up for the upcoming year, I'm doing a short one hour, just an overview of the basics of E-Rate. So if you are never done it before and you're interested, good show for you. It'll be a very high level, not all the different exact, you know, step by step, but just a high level overview of it. Um, or if you just need a refresher, if you're getting back into it, if you're a new library director or a new library staff who have never uh, done this, you keep hearing about it and you know I'm you're supposed to, this is a good, good intro. Um, like I said, I will have fuller, longer workshops. I am, as one of my duties here at the Library Commission, it says on here, I am the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries. So I handle all the training, education, um, hand-holding <laughs> whatever our, our libraries here in Nebraska need uh, to do E-Rate. Um, other states, every state has their own um, public library uh, coordinator and a school library coordinator, so um, you would have your own people that will help you with it, but anyone who wants to is in, um, invited to attend that next week. And any of our other shows we have coming up here as well. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Erica, for being here. Good to see you. And hopefully we'll see some of you uh, in a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.